بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين جزاكم الله خير for the attendance and جزاكم الله خير for the brothers and the sisters who organized the, this event i'm sure the sisters also had some sort of role in in, in preparing and so on so جزاكم الله خير also um, <coughs> i know time is getting tight so i won't uh, delve too long into introduction but the topic of this discussion or this talk is developing a functional relationship with the Quran and many a times when we come to discuss the Quran we talk about developing a relationship with the Quran but I caveat it by saying a functional relationship with the Quran because I believe the nature of our relationship nowadays has become very superficial and we do have some level of relationship but it's not the relationship that's transformative it's not the relationship that the Sahaba had with the Quran. So the hope inshallah is that we're able to arrive at a point where we develop a relationship that enables us to embody those elements and those, that spirit that the Sahaba had and with the Prophet Sallallahu at their helm. So first and foremost we have to appreciate the notion that we've developed barriers based on bad habit over years. That Historically, or even up until today, the Qur'an has become a text that we simply use as a talisman, astaghfirullah, or we might put on the shelf and we might keep it there and dust it off every once in a while, or here and there we'll read it, pick it up, maybe read it, we come to the masjid a little bit early, we'll pick it up and read it. And there are some of us who even, mashallah, memorize the Qur'an, and memorizing the Qur'an is one of the best and greatest pursuits individual can do in their life. But once again, that is not fully a functional relationship with the Qur'an. And by functional, I mean that the Qur'an becomes your daily sustenance. I mean, you cannot function in your life that you wake up in the morning just like you have to go and grab your key so you can get into your car and leave. That you actually need the Qur'an so that you can function in your day. Right? And not simply something that you return to here and there and you pick it up and you, and you kiss it and, uh, and it's very nice. And, all these notions that have just become very materialistic in nature and superficial at times, right? So we want to understand how can we delve deeper and develop something that's more entertaining and functional and, and, and vital. So first and foremost, and as my sheikh, in, one of my shaykh in Egypt, rahimahullah, actually just passed away this morning, I found out, Allah yarhamu. Uh, he passed away, he was 94 years old, and um, he's a mufassir. He wrote an, an entire tafsir called Fathur Rahman. Sheikh Abdul Minam Ta'ilab, I don't know if any of you are here have heard of him, but he's one of the most revered scholars in Egypt, and he's a very well respected scholar. And we would sit with him every Friday for three hours in the morning. And one of the things that he would tell us, and, and then I would look into the text and I found very similar sayings, is that the best mufassir of the Quran is the individual himself. Now, automatically that might sound a little weird because you think to yourself, um, you know, isn't that a little bit dangerous? Am I allowed to deal with the Quran in that fashion? Can I be a mufassir? Well, the meaning is not, I mean, you're not a mufassir, for example, like Imam Qurtubi or Tabari or Ibn Ashur or Ibn Kathir or all these many remarkable scholars. But by the best mufassir, meaning that you engage the Quran in the fashion that affects you personally, right? That you have a personal relationship with the Quran that when you look into it, you say, you know what, that verse hits me right here. And that verse really kind of deals with this situation that I've been dealing with for quite some time. Like I'll give you a quick story. My, uh, in Egypt, uh, most buildings have doormen. So one, one time we were coming home from Fedj, my doorman and I, and we were walking back and uh, he's like, can, you, can we sit down with the security guard over here just so we can talk to him a little bit because he doesn't pray. So he starts to tell me, um, you know, I'm not praying and I'm struggling with praying and so on. So the doorman just kind of, you know, he, he asked me to come and speak to him, but he decided to start speaking. So I was like, you know what, let me, I, actually, I'm interested to see what he has to say. So he begins to say, subhanAllah, and I was really mesmerized. He started to say, and this is someone who's illiterate, doesn't read or write or anything. And he says, you know, uh, and he tells the person his name. He's like, I, I come home from Fedj and I start wiping down the cars because that's his morning kind of uh, routine. And I just look into the sky and I say, Alhamdulillah. And something 
very beautiful comes over me and then suddenly I'm, I'm thinking alhamdulillah my kids are healthy and they live in a shack I mean he literally lives my kids are healthy and we all have bellies that are full and and then subhanallah what the, the verse that came to mind was and I shared this verse with him and then he said that's exactly how I feel right so you begin to see that in your day-to-day -day affairs the Quran plays a very key role in your ability to connect with Allah and we'll see the reasons for the Quran and why the Quran is even with us in the first place but you'll see that on a day-to-day -day level, on a minute-to-minute -minute level, there is something significant that the Qur'an can offer you in every minute of your day. And to truly appreciate this notion, we assess the life of Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu was someone, we've all heard stories of Umar obviously, and we all kind of know who he was. But pre-Islam or pre the Qur'an, Umar was, was below barbarian radiallahu anhu. I mean, he was someone who was truly a treacherous person. I mean, he, he killed his daughter and buried her alive. And, and he would beat up women just for, for fun's sake. And he was just a, a really difficult person. That's, and that's putting it lightly, right? But if you assess Umar's life post-Quran, you see a remarkable transformation. And this is why I say that the Quran was a transformative text. Because if you, if you know the life of Umar, you see that even there are, there are times when he would kind of give uh, glad tidings that there's a verse that's going to come or you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal the verse and Umar speaking about it, the same exact topic, right? So he developed something unique about the, with the Qur'an. But you see someone who transformed from what he was into an individual who was known and revered until today for two major character traits, for his, for his justice and being a just individual and for someone who was merciful, right? I mean, someone who, who had not one ounce of mercy, and that's why they said, they would say when they heard that, you know, Umar is becoming Muslim. They would say, Umar, wallahi, even if Umar's donkey becomes Muslim, he won't become Muslim. No way can he become Muslim, right? And then suddenly he becomes this individual who is embodied in mercy and imbued with mercy and rahmah and justice and so on. To the extent that one time he was sitting with his kids in his house, and he was on the floor, he was playing around with them and so on. And I mean, just a beautiful sight that you can think of. And you think of the Prophet with Hassan and Hussein, etc. And one of his mayors come in. I believe he was the mayor of Syria. He comes in and he sees him. And, uh, and he looks at him and he's like, you know, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm playing with my children. He says, uh, so Sayyidina Umar asks him, what do you do with your children? He said, when I come into the room, they stand up and they stay quiet. I don't kiss them. I don't hug them. Nothing. That's, that's the nature of my relationship with my kids. So Sayyidina Umar said, okay, you're removed from your mayorship of Syria. That's it. No one can be that way with his family and have mercy with his people. So if that's the case, then you're removed. This is Sayyidina Umar. Remember who he was pre-Islam. So just a quick analogy that might help. The Sahaba, their relationship with the Quran was a very practical and functional one. They were awaiting the verses like, you know, like a bird awaits its mom coming at home or its dad coming with the food so they can, you know, sitting there with their mouths open, waiting, waiting for the food to come in. That's exactly how the Sahaba were. Even better yet, you know, obviously the Sahaba are ten time, you know, a thousand times better than this. But like if you think of a, someone who's a punt returner in football, you know how he's just kind of looking for the ball then he grabs it and then he runs forward and he starts dodging and juking and you know stiff arming and everything so he can get to the end zone that's exactly how the sahaba were they were waiting for the quran they can come they 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 take it all in and they move forward and they start functioning and they start dodging this obstacle and that obstacle and it, it allows them to become stronger and they're able to create all these different moves and so on so they can get to their end zone on the other hand we're more like you know, if, if, if I can say this, we're more like, the, uh, like a lazy uh, halfback or a lazy running back. We, we get the Qur'an, like the, the quarterback will give us the Qur'an, then we quickly pass it off. Like we throw it off to the side. Like we're not too interested in this book. I'm not, I mean, just get away from me. Give us, let someone else run with it, right? Whereas they were fully capable of appreciating the Qur'an and the transformative nature of the Qur'an. So... Let's just quickly talk about the Qur'an, speaking about the Qur'an, like what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an about the Qur'an. 
He says, number one, it's ruh, it's a spirit. وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِّنْ أَمْرِنَا Right, that we have revealed to you a spirit from our affairs. And it's shifa, it's healing. Right, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمًا Right, the Qur'an is, is healing and he's revealed to us this healing and this mercy. Right, the Qur'an is huda, it's guidance. أَلِفْ لَا مِيمْ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا للمتقين. The Qur'an is nur. كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ لِتُخْرِجَ النَّاسِ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ Right? The Qur- so if we think of all these notions, and then we think of our lives in the Qur'an, so we think the Qur'an is ruh, the Qur'an is spirit, the Qur'an is healing, the Qur'an is guidance. These are all factors that we would wish to have in our day-to-day lives. That as we're progressing, and we're dealing, that we're being guided. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is healing us, and we're imbued in light. And, and so on and so forth. The Prophet Sallallahu let's see what the Prophet Sallallahu in the hadith has to say about the Qur'an. He says, اِقْرَأُوا الْقُرْآنِ فَإِنَّهُ يَأْتِي شَفِيعًا يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ Read the Qur'an for it truly comes as an intercessor on the Day of Judgment. The Qur'an, if you, if you have a relationship with the Qur'an, it'll come in and it'll intercede. And it'll say, Ya Allah, Abdak, this servant of yours, he had a relationship with me. Right? So please. And then the Prophet said another hadith. He says, مَثَلُ الَّذِي يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنِ كَالْحَيِّ وَالْمَيِّتِ Right? The example of the person who reads the Qur'an and the one who doesn't read the Qur'an is the one who's, it's as if the one who's alive and dead. Right? Exactly analogous. So Khalid, interestingly enough, Khalid ibn Walid, when he heard this hadith and he remembered the ayah of وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا he said to himself, subhanAllah, this is when I'm talking about practical functional relationship. He, they didn't just listen and they didn't just sit there and Rahim, what we do with the Quran. And, and we sit down, we do hifd, okay, I have to do hifd quickly because my shaykh is coming and he's gonna, my father's going to beat me up if I don't do my hifd today. That's the kind of the nature of the relationship that we've developed, right? But for Sayyidina Khalid, it was more, so hold on, I have ruh. If I have the Quran in my heart, I have ruh. And the one who doesn't have the Quran is dead. So he combined the ayat and the hadith and he said, SubhanAllah, when I go onto the battlefield, I am someone who's alive. I am someone who's vibrant. I have the Qur'an with me. And he's not saying it arrogantly the way we do today because we come out and we're so, we're arrogant by default for some reason. We think that because we're Muslim, we're automatically arrogant and we can put ourselves above and beyond the rest. That's not the case for a Muslim, for a true believer. Right, and, and just, I mean, as a side note, it just came to mind, but Abu al Maududi, rahimahullah, he says something very interesting. He says, are we truly Muslims so that we can call others kuffar? You know, do we, do we really truly embody the true essence of a Muslim so that we can actually call someone else that you're a kafir? Right, have we, have we, have we presented a true example of Islam? So it's something to think about. So... Because I know time is running short, I just, I'll skip over a few things. I want to actually get into what the purpose of the Qur'an is. And I'm not going to get into the discussion of the scholars over this and the names of scholars because this is not the time for it. But just give you a, 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 a sum um, or a kind of a, a quick reflection on what the Qur'an and the purpose of the Qur'an is. So the scholars over the years have discussed this and they've said they've kind of boiled it down to three things. They say, number one, the Qur'an is for purposes of Tawheed, right? Knowing who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Number two, Tazkiyah, purification, your ibadah, your heart, right? That's the second major purpose of the Qur'an. And three is Imran, is development, building, your path in this life, how you function, how you live in this life. So if you look at, for example, Surah Al-Nahr, and you want to take number one, Tawheed, you read Surah Al-Nahl to see the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. Go read Surah Al-Nahl and really reflect upon the blessings of Allah. And just a quick note, if you cannot read the Qur'an in Arabic, it's not a problem. Go buy a translation, any translation you like. And live with the Qur'an. I'm telling you, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you in any language. Just live with it. And if you want me to advise with a specific translation that's new and I really enjoy very much, it's called the Qur'an. <laughs> and it's translated by uh, an individual's name is M.A.S. Abdul Halim. 
and it's Oxford University Press, and it's Barnes and Nobles. Or Barnes and Noble. So I would suggest that you buy it because the language is very simple and straightforward, and nothing's perfect. No translation is perfect, but this is a very good translation, in my opinion. So if you want to, if you want to actually think about Tawheed and who Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is, return to Surah an nahr and look at the blessings of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. If you want to appreciate the majesty and the dominion of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala upon us, then I would suggest that you go and read Surah An'am, for example. Go read Surah Al-An'am and just and marvel in the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So this is how you begin to develop a functional relationship. That you go into the Quran, you're looking for Tawheed, you're looking for who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Because as our, our, our brother Suhaib was saying, I mean to have that type of taqwa, you have to know who you're dealing with. You have to know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. You're not going to be able to come to that point where you have, where your, 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 your taqwa has, has kind of become your, your existence without knowing who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. If you want to learn about tazkiyah and ibadah and so on, think of the ayah, for example, of, like I mentioned, وَفِي rizqukum, and that in the skies is your rizq. Or if you're going through a tough time and, and you know, you're, just, you're, you're really exhausted and there's a lot of difficulties in your life, you start to read the Qur'an and, and for example, you come upon the verses in Surah Al-Ankabut that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّا الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ So you assume, so now let's say I'm, I'm doing and I'm trying and so on and it's just, it's really stressful. So I open up Surah Al-Ankabut and I look and I see SubhanAllah, look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling me. He's saying, did you assume that you were going to say I believe and not be tested? Who told you to make that assumption? So suddenly things start making sense. Wallahi subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, this, Allah is telling me how to deal with my situation. Allah, and then he continues to say that he's tested you so that he knows who's, tru who's truthful and who's dishonest. Who says I believe and I'm fully truthful about that belief? And who says I believe and they're dishonest in their belief? And they don't embody what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked them to embody. You want to talk about number three? I'm, I'm just giving you just highlights, but the Quran, I mean, the Quran is exactly these three things. So every page you can find so much on these things. Right? But it, these are tools that will help you go into the Quran and, and think and read and say, where can I find this? Let me actually think about Allah, number one. Number two, tazkiyah, my heart, my ibadah, my relationship with Allah. Let me see what verses are saying that. Number three, Imran, and that your existence in life and the path that you're, you're living on. Right? قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ بَنَيْنَاهَا وَزَيَّنَّاهَا وَمَا لَهَا مِنْ فُرُوجِ Go into the earth and see and look and discover. And, and look how we've created it. Skies and earths and mountains. And there's no gaps and nothing. Everything's perfect and in sync. Right? I, I don't know if you guys have watched, uh, you guys and sisters, I have watched uh, this uh, series called Planet Earth. The BBC series. Uh, so I think that's one of the most remarkable series I've ever watched on TV or on anything. And a lot of people, when you kind of, if, if you kind of followed the, the, the series, you'll see one of the things that w was happening constantly were the people who, were, who had to videotape these things would sit for hours and hours and days and weeks even in the same exact location looking for one bird in the Galapagos, for example, doing their little dance, right? And your automatic reaction is like, this guy's crazy. I mean, three weeks sitting down looking for a bird? I mean, who would do that? Well, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, that is actually Tawheed in action. Now, he's not a Muslim. But if we understood this verse of قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ of go into the land and look, then we would think to ourselves, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create all of this abathan? وَالْعَيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ Of course not. He didn't create this haphazardly or for no reason. He created it so that we can discover and we can look and He's telling us to do so. So how come we're never the ones who go and discover and look and try to see and uncover things in this earth? How come we're not those people? How come we insist on every other occupation or maybe just two or three occupations, right? And we, and we neglect all these other remarkable things that we can be doing that are actually practical applications of Tawheed and, and a practical and functional relationship with the Qur'an. So this is something to think about. So now, inshallah, hopefully it's becoming clearer. 
you begin to look at the Qur'an in a different light. It's no longer just something you're going to come and sit with in the masjid quickly and you're going to read you know, 10 minutes of the Qur'an or 5 minutes of the Qur'an, just put it away and that's it. But rather you wake up, you purchase your own independent Qur'an, your own individual Qur'an, and it's with you constantly. And then something comes to your mind, you look through the Qur'an, and wallahi subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings upon us are remarkable. I guarantee, you know, and this is because I've, I'm speaking from personal experience. I'll be going through something and then I'll pick up the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put me on the page that just makes all the sense for me, right? And, and you know, one of my teachers would say that one of his sunan, his own personal sunan, is that whenever he sees the Quran, he picks up, he reads one verse and he just thinks about it. Thinks about it for an hour, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. So begin to have this reflective relationship with the Qur'an. Not simply, you know, I, the, the discussion is in preparation for the Qur'an, in, in, in the preparation for Ramadan. But the reason I'm focusing on the Qur'an and not putting it within the context of Ramadan is because I believe this is an act that's required year around and, and, and we, we have kind of, you know, muzzled the Qur'an simply into Ramadan. And the only time we have a relationship with the Qur'an is in Ramadan, right, if any. Even if in Ramadan we have a relationship. So I want us to figure out a way that throughout our days and our years that we are actually engaging the Quran outside. And some of you might think to yourself, well, you know, alhamdulillah, I have a car, I have a family, I have a house, I have a job. I don't really see myself needing to return to the Quran. Like, you're, all right, what you're saying is good. I mean, go to the Quran, it'll give you light, it'll give you guidance, it'll give you this and that. But I don't really see myself needing that on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, I guarantee if one of those things slip, suddenly you'll be miserable. And because you've allowed, and, and by the way, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Nasu Allah fa ansahum anfusahum. You forgot about Allah, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let you forget about yourself. So he'll, you'll go and you'll be relaxed and you'll think, quote, you, you assume that you're relaxed, and you, th you assume everything's wonderful. But I guarantee one of those things slip, you're in a deep depression and you go and somehow drugs become a part of your life, right? And drinking becomes a part of your life. And all these miserable realities for people that have neglected the Qur'an. So, I just want to talk about a little bit about the nature of the Qur'an. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kind of goes through the Qur'an and what He does in the Qur'an. So that we can kind of look out for these things because I don't want to just say the Qur'an is good, go read it. But I want, hopefully, that you can start looking for things while you're reading. And we can begin this process together. So generally speaking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions stories. He mentions examples. He'll mention logical arguments. He, he constantly, he, he'll, he'll, he'll speak to the mind. People who think, people who reflect. Right? He gives us reminders of the afterlife. And he talks about the afterlife. He talks about this world and the signs in this world, right? And, and the relevance of these things in our day-to-day -day affairs. So if we look at Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Fatiha sums up everything basically. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Tawheed, like we said, the three things, Tawheed, Tazkiyah, and Imran. Number two, Tazkiyah, Ihdina, Ihdina Ya Rabb, Ihdina, guide us Ya Allah, right? There's Tazkiyah, Sirat al ladina An'am the path, the path الذي أنعمت عليهم What was that path? What was that Sirat al-Mustaqeem? That was the path of the Sahaba. What was the path of the Sahaba? It was a practical, functional path where they were creating and developing and being involved and going and going to different regions and trying to grow and trying to grow Islam. Islam wasn't simply this, this uh, you know, uh, thing that I did in the masjid here and there. But rather it was an existence that I lived with in my everyday life. We look at Surah Al-Baqarah, for example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off with a discussion on Bani Israel. Then he speaks about criminal law. Then he speaks about inheritance law. Then he speaks about fasting. Then he speaks about your individual character. Then he speaks about hajj. Then he speaks about qital, war. Because war is a part of life. Then he speaks about infaq, giving. Then he speaks about marriage. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about finances and riba. And, 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 and then he speaks about, he goes back to aqidah and tawheed. And then finally, he ends off a dua. Rabbana, Rabbana wa la tahmil, Rabbana, Rabbana wa la tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu alaydina min qablina, Rabbana wa la tuhammilna ma la taqata lana bih, wa afu anna wa Oh Allah, give us the strength 
to carry this load. Allow us to be able to do what the Sahaba did. Allow us to carry this whole load, this message that you want us to deliver. And, and, and do not burden us more than we can handle. And, and, and forgive us and, and, and look beyond our sins. Right? So you see the Quran kind of sums up everything for us. You go into Surah Ali Imran, there's a discussion on beliefs, the different belief structures in this world and, and the, how the Quran and Islam destroy all these, all these other belief systems that exist. And then you go into Surah An-Nisa and you start seeing the tools required to accomplish all of these remarkable goals that we want to achieve. And you see justice. Right? You see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about justice, being just with your children, being just with your family, right? being just with the non-Muslims. So you think to yourself, what was Sayyidina Umar doing? Sayyidina Umar, he understood this. He read Surah An-Nisa and he began to apply it. He truly appreciated what Surah An-Nisa was saying. So he was just. Because a lot of us today, we're not just with our families. The amount of stories that I hear about young girls being, even in America, being forced into arranged marriages and being forced into specific career paths, right? And, and, and young guys who have to deal with the fitna of their parents because their parents are forcing certain things upon them, right? And I'm not just blaming the parents. I know, you know, a lot of the young people have problems also. But where is the rahmah? Where is the mercy? Where is the, just, where is the justice? Where is the, you know, equality that we're, we're, we have to embody ourselves with so that we can uphold this message to the, to the society around us. So it's very important for us to understand these notions. And then quickly, if you look at Surah Al-Hadid, right, literally metal, think about Surah Al-Hadid, and think about number three, Imran building, and, and, and discovering new ores, and, and, and creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, and how we're supposed to be developing and creating and progressing, etc. Right? Look into Surah An-Naml. Surah An-Naml for what? For management. I mean, you want true management skills? Go study the life of Sayyidina Sulaiman and how he managed the ants and how he managed uh, the jinn and etc. Right? And by the way, I mean, I'm not saying that Surah An-Naml is a, is, a, is a surah on management. <laughs> you know, just, so, I mean, obviously Surah An-Naml has much more to be offered. But I'm giving you examples of how you can look into the, the, the Qur'an and you start to see the relevance of the Qur'an in your day-to-day -day affairs, right? If you're a manager, you study the life of Sayyidina Sulaiman and see how he functioned, how, how he dealt with his, his uh, people. You want to raise your children, go into Surah Al-Luqman, read Surah Al-Luqman. You want to do something with media, and I know this might sound weird to people, but read Surah Al-Shuhara, right? There might be something there for you, and there is in my opinion. Go read Surah Al-Shu'ara and read and see and reflect and see what you can extract from the Qur'an in your day-to-day -day affairs. And this is what I believe the scholars meant by you are the best mufassir. Because the goal of the Qur'an is your individual relationship and the effect it has you as a person. Right? A lot of us, we take a very academic, knowledge-based approach. So say even if I'm doing tafsir, I go, okay, I have this verse, I'm going to take out Ibn Kathir, this is what he says. And I'm going to take out Qurtubi and this is what he says, right? And it's simply just an academic material kind of engagement. It's not a personal thing, right? Of course you should go back, and I go back to these scholars all the time. You should go back for the true and tafsir of the sabab al-nuzul and the linguistic formulations and so on. But what we're talking about is that personal relationship that enables you to move forward with this text, with the Qur'an. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ Right? So we might think to ourselves, well, you know, it's just a difficult text for me to actually read. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, no, it's not. And as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that it's the case, then that is exactly what it is. It is not a, it's not a difficult text. And you can engage it, and you can go, and you can read, and you can try, and you can learn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the doors for you in any language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, will open the doors for you. And finally, Surah An-Nur, and, and I specifically wanted to end with Surah An-Nur because Surah An-Nur is, is one of my favorite surah, that's why I want to end with it. <laughs> but also, the, the lessons that you can learn from it in your day-to-day -day life and in societal affairs are remarkable. Right? If, we, if we just take verse by verse and think and reflect, we'll see so much being given to us. Surah An-Nur basically talks about 
societal relationships. How do you function in society? Right? Development and relationships and so on. Your character, societal character and so on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says number one, he talks about permission. This is in no specific order, but the, the various topics that are discussed in this surah. Taking permission and being someone who's polite. Lowering your gaze for both men and women. Hijab, eliminating evil. Backbiting and the evils of backbiting. Fornication. So Allah is telling us so many various things that will destroy our societies and, 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 and primarily will destroy our lives. Right? But so you think to yourself, well, is there something, what's the correlation between a nur and these things? Right? Because this is how you have to think when you're reading the Quran. Because every, thing, every single thing in the Quran has a meaning and has a hidden secret that you need to uncover. Right? Allah doesn't name things haphazardly. The names of the surah are tawqifi. They're, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named the, the, these names, named the, named the surah these names. So we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what is the source of this nur? The source of this nur that will descend upon you if you embody these things is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. So now we understand that Allah is the source of this light. And this light will descend upon whom? Right? Will descend upon those fi buyutin adhin Allah. Right? In the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On rijalun la tulhihum. On men. Men in here being people, men and men and women, etc. لا تُلِهِمْ تَجَارَةً That business does not distract them from their realities. Right? So suddenly you see, okay, now you have, Allah wants us in this surah to do A, B, C, and D. He wants us to be polite and take permission. Not just barge in and, and you know, like uh, um, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah once, he was sitting and uh, people came and they started banging on the door. He said, don't bang like the police bang on the door. Bang like, a, <laughs> you know, bang like a Muslim. Don't just sit there and, not that a policeman can be a Muslim, but don't sit there and bang and try to break down the door. So we, we take permission and then we see, okay, so we take permission, what's gonna happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, this light source, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the light. And suddenly we'll be embodied in light. Right? And light will be the way in which we exist in this life. And we're seeing binurillah, we're seeing with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So you think to yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَثَلُ نُورِهِ كَمِشْكَاتٍ فِيهَا مِسْبَاحِ كَمِشْكَاتٍ فِيهَا مِسْبَاحِ What is a mishka fiha misbah? Right? A mishka fiha misbah is basically a light source that's in a wall that's, that's lit. It's lit with a candle or whatever. Can a candlelight go out? Yes, it can go out. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's light will never go out. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the light that He gives us, can it go out? Yes. What's the maintenance required? The maintenance is required is you continue to fulfill these actions that He's asked you to engage in. And you continue to embody them, etc. That is the only way that you'll have this light continuing. So you see that there's a connection between the name of the surah. And then the actions required within the surah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the whole equation becomes clear. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and if you don't do these things, and I just went through a very blunt and quick explanation of the surah, but go in and, and spend all the time you want. Because wallahi, you'll probably come out with more gems than I can. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you don't do all this, ظُلُمَاتٌ بَعْضُهَا فَوْقَ بَعْضٌ Right? Just compounded darkness. Darkness upon darkness upon darkness and you'll be depressed and sad and decrepit and Going in a direction that's just miserable because what? وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ Whoever rejects my dhikr and the best form of dhikr is what? Is what? Dhikr, the best form of dhikr is what? The Quran وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ the one who rejects my dhikr, my Qur'an, he will have a miserable life. So with that, inshallah, the month of Qur'an is upon us. And I'm, I mean, let's say I'm closing. But I'll repeat myself. The message is the Qur'an in and outside of Ramadan. There's undoubtedly, there's a secret Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to us the Qur'an in the month of Ramadan. So the month of Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. And the month of Ramadan is, is, is raised high because the Qur'an was revealed upon in it. So if there is any moment, and you have 11 days before, or 11 or 12, whatever, days before Ramadan starts, 
take these moments to begin this relationship so that when Ramadan comes, you can maximize. I'm telling you right now, just spend 5-10 minutes a day. Not more, not less. 5-10 minutes. But sit down and actually read. Go buy a translation for those who, who can't read the Arabic. Go buy a translation and sit down and live with those pages for 10 minutes or 5 minutes. And, and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He showers you with huda, with mercy, with guidance, with healing, with nur. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He enables us to develop this relationship in our lives and that He allows the Qur'an to become a functional reality in our day-to-day -day affairs. And we beg His forgiveness. And if anything that was said was beneficial, then it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anything that was said that was inappropriate or wrong is from my weaknesses and my mistakes as a creature. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to what is best. Wa jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.